the remaining local newspaper and exert massive influence over a community by wielding three TV stations, eight radio stations, the cable operator, plus the already monopolistic newspaper. The decision further allows the already massive television networks to buy up even more local TV stations so that they could control up to an unbelievable 80 or 90 percent of the national television audience. Where are the blessings of localism, diversity, and competition? I see centralization, not localism. I see uniformity, not diversity. I see monopoly and oligopoly, not competition. It would be anathema to the First Amendment to regulate media ownership in an effort to steer consumers towards other programming. 90% of the top cable channels are owned by the same giants that own the TV networks and the cable systems. More channels are great, but when they're all owned by the same people, cable doesn't advance localism, editorial diversity, and competition. And those who believe the Internet alone will save us from this fate should realize that the dominating Internet news sources are controlled by the same media giants who control radio, TV, newspapers, and cable. I refuse to pour one ounce of cement to support a structure that dictates to the American people what they should watch, listen to, or think. The public reaction against the proposed changes has been unlike anything the FCC has ever seen. Of the nearly three quarters of a million comments we have received, nearly all oppose increased media consolidation over 99.9%. Those commissioners voting in favor of the item signify by saying aye. 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 Those those opposed signify. The item is adopted. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. list of well-recognized people and organizations who oppose all or part of the FCC's media ownership rules is one of the strangest list of strange bedfellows you'll ever hear. Opponents include Walter Cronkite, William Sapphire, the National Rifle Association, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the National Organization for Women, Senator Jesse Helms. The theoretically, do your regulation is good, but it's not always the right way to go. In the shadow of the largest corporate scandals in the history of this country, the last thing we need is to have regulators with no teeth. I believe it appears to me so evident that the big interests were served here at the expense of the public interest. Would you not agree with me that today those who most aggressively celebrate your decision are the biggest economic interests in broadcasting in this country. Are they not the ones that are celebrating your decision? I have no idea who's celebrating our decision. You really don't? Are you kidding me? You say they're modest changes. Clearly they're not modest changes. When, when in nearly 200 cities, newspapers will be able to buy the television station, you say that uh, it'll promote more competition. Nonsense. The evidence suggests that is simply not the case. You say that there'll be few mergers and acquisitions. Of course, that stands logic on its head. And you say the court made us do it. The court didn't make you do it. I mean, this is the, the old joke in the movie, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Commissioner Abernathy, you said that uh, we were acting out of irrational fear instead of hard facts with respect to the issue of consolidation. Is there any uh, evidence that you see with respect to consolidation, particularly with respect to radio in recent years, and also television, that would suggest we have an irrational fear of consolidation? What you have to balance here is you have to balance the First Amendment rights of the licensees against the rights uh, of all the, uh, the public to have diversity, localism, and competition. The founders did not anticipate uh, the protections for commercial speech that we now have and nor did they anticipate essentially the warp to uh, the sense of the First Amendment that has occurred really since the 1970s. We have to revisit the terms. What did they mean? What were they talking about? They can't possibly have meant 
that there should be free speech rights for transnational corporations because there weren't any back in the 18th century. They didn't exist. They weren't thinking of that. They were thinking of the citizens of the democracy. Citizens have First Amendment rights to a diversity of antagonistic views. Media reform is something that is absolutely crucial. It is the primary issue. It is the most important thing. Nothing is more important because if we don't have a media system that we can use to get our word out, whatever our word may be, if there is not a viable democratic media system for getting that word out, forget it. You know, we're screwed. We're completely screwed. We need antitrust activity, okay? And, and that's a complicated thing, and it will require that we rethink the, the very basis of antitrust law, which at the moment is all economistic. We have to understand that the real reasons why we particularly need to look at antitrust in the realm of media industries is not, be, not for business reasons, not for economic reasons primarily, but because the content, the crucial content of the news is, is completely distorted by... Uh, uh, large commercial interests. For the 2004 election, the major networks hired Edison Media Research and Matoski International to conduct exit polls. Throughout Election Day, those polls suggested that John Kerry would win the popular vote by 3%. The official vote count showed Bush winning by 2.5%, a discrepancy of 5.5%, or 8 million votes. The mainstream news media dismissed these polls. but in a fit of irony, used the Ukrainian exit polls as a basis to call that election into question. And except for the internet, the story largely disappeared. On January 19, 2005, Edison Matovsky released a report on their exit polls. The New York Times ran the story the next day, Inauguration Day on page A14. A group of academics and statisticians from a number of major universities analyzed the report. Quote, Edison Matovsky assumes the correctness of the election results, which their own data undercuts. The pollsters surmise that somehow Maybe more Kerry voters responded to the polls. But no data in the report supports the hypothesis that Kerry voters were more likely than Bush voters to cooperate with pollsters. And the data suggests the opposite may have been true. In the face of pervasive reports of voting anomalies in Ohio, Representative John Conyers conducted an inquiry that raises even more questions. He also called upon the networks. In a letter, he requested the raw poll data. I am hopeful that the media companies will also understand and support the importance of providing complete and transparent information in this matter. If it happens, but you don't hear about it, did it happen? Some reporters have compared George W. Bush to Ronald Reagan. I reflected back on the Post interview from 1980 and about the hostages. How often do major news stories get buried down the public memory hole while a lie is turned into truth. There's a window of opportunity now. Most governments, 
uh, most countries have not figured out how to limit access to them to the internet and they've not figured out and powerful companies have not figured out how to block information that is inconvenient or unfriendly to them or that they don't like off of the internet at least in this brief window that we have before they all figure it out will history repeat itself will the public find out about the threat to the internet before it's too late we're not in the clear here at all I and mean, this is not a straight shot here where we can just go ahead and do whatever we want it's it's complicated but but it's new and there's some things we don't know about it and no one else knows about it and as long as there's that is there the slightest bit of vagueness or the unknown element is is something I'm going to exploit as much as possible <laughs> Obviously, if he's a convicted felon, his credibility is nothing, but his story was totally ridiculous. The George Bush campaign has been saying that it's, quote, 
libelous and untrue as if they have to be redundant when they're lying about us. We're the new publishing company that bought it. They cannot release it for legal reasons. Maybe I am the super, and maybe I had to sweep and mop just to have this great little office here in the basement, but uh, we have a right. At the time that the giveaway of Digital Spectrum was being discussed, and the as a key part of the telecommunications reform bill, so-called reform of 1996, critics were saying this isn't about high-definition TV. This isn't about each each media owner giving, you know, producing a better picture of their already existing programming. This is about them spinning Channel 7 into Channel 7A through G and making a profit in each of those different sub-channels. But we couldn't be heard in the mainstream media. People that were saying that that's a likely scenario were censored in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Can that law be changed? Well, the law can be changed only if a movement forms of grassroots citizens who elect a new kind of Congress that is n somehow not beholden to the big media owners, but is beholden to what's a good idea in communications policy, yeah, clearly it could be changed. But the, the, it's a chicken and egg argument. Um, the chicken that currently squawks is the one that's, you know, as a Congress that's controlled by the media owners. If you could replace the media owners, I mean, if you could replace the Congress, you could change the media laws. And that could be done very quickly. There's nothing mysterious about how to reform the media. Instead of delivering it 95%, 98% to uh, six or ten giant conglomerates, you could do what was proposed in the 1930s in this grassroots movement behind the Wagner-Hatfield Amendment. And you could say, let's take a bunch of these licenses, TV and radio licenses, and let's distribute some to educational institutions. They can do what they want with them. Some labor unions, some family farmer groups, some religious institutions, uh, some consumer groups. Let's just distribute the licenses to nonprofit groups, not 99% or 98% or 95% giant conglomerates. Let's take 20% of the licenses or 50% of the licenses and give them out to nonprofits. I mean, there's nothing mysterious about changing the media policy. And indeed, we have so much technology. We're on the verge of a communications revolution, which is being stopped and stymied because a handful of corporations control the media. But we now have the possibility of what, are, what could be called citizen journalists where it's now so much easier to produce a high, pu high quality publication because the layout is so much cheaper and, and distribution through the internet is so cheap. And you can produce high quality, as you know better than me, a video um, because the cameras are better and cheaper and the digital editing is better and cheaper. So everyone knows that we could be having a revolution in democracy and journalism. Everyone doesn't know. Anyone who knows the field, right, only, I mean, the people that are in the field, believe me, the media owners know, the conglomerates that write the law, that make sure they are the gatekeepers, that stymie, that, you know, as we say, there are eight or ten corporations that have their foot on the uh, windpipe of the First Amendment. They're sitting on the windpipe of the First Amendment. They know it. People who do your kind of work know it. But we have this ability now to do such quality journalism at such a cheaper cost. And research is much cheaper through the web. So, you, you know, in the old days, it cost so much to afford an AP tick, ticker tape, where you'd have the hourly news coming into your newsroom. That was in the hands of a few thousand places. Now it's in the hands of a few million people. So the ability to produce journalism is we're, we're on the verge of uh, unbelievable democratization of journalism. In terms of and, becoming hotly broadcast. Right. Oh, yeah, broadcast quality and seen by many people. But see, no one knows that better than the handful of media owners, and they're the ones that write the laws that benefit them and prevent the flowering of democracy and the flowering of journalism. But changing the laws, 
happen overnight if we had a different Congress. And by the way, there are a number of Congress members that want to change the laws and want to undo uh, big parts of the telecommunications bill. They're a minority of a few dozen progressive Democrats. We have to uh, talk about re-regulation. We have to revisit the whole point about the airwaves being publicly owned and the TV station and radio station owners therefore being obliged to observe certain regulations. And again, the First Amendment will be used to interfere with this. But if we uh, can offer a coherent and, and compelling argument about the First Amendment being there for the people and not for commercial interests, we can have that discussion. We can talk about re-regulation. And we can begin to talk back against this, this whole recent move to discredit any notion of public interest on First Amendment grounds. I think that's perverse. My concern is that there are enormous problems facing our country which need serious discussion. They are solvable problems. They can be solved if we as a nation begin debating these issues, formulating policy, implementing that policy. I am outraged, I am frustrated beyond belief that the most important issues facing America, the decline in the standard of living of working people, our disastrous trade policy, our disastrous health care policy, the, high, the priorities of this country by which we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the world and at the same time we give huge tax breaks to the rich, the loss of local control if you like, the fact that we're becoming less and less de democratic in the sense that people have less and less control over their own lives. All of those issues need to be discussed. None of those issues in any substantive way are being discussed by the media. And what is happening is the media is throwing out to us every day the scandal of the day, the sensations. We go from the NBA playoffs, the NCAA playoffs, the Super Bowl. We're thrown every day the things that we are supposed to be interested in, but none of those things are relevant to our lives. How do we improve this country so that everybody has a decent standard of living? And how do we save the environment? And how do we deal with all of the race prejudice and the gender prejudice that exists? Can we as a nation do it? You're damn well. We can do it. This is a great nation. We have a lot of extraordinarily good people here. But we will not solve those problems until they are discussed. These issues will not be discussed until the media focuses on them. And the media will not focus on it so long as you have a handful of corporations controlling it and using the media only to expand their profit base rather than improve our democracy. Florida. Oh, sorry if you don't want to talk about this, but you know, I know people say get over it. I ain't ever getting over it. <laughs> too, many, too many people died to the right to this vote. Every investigation has shown that if you count the whole state, Gore wins. If you count just the four counties, if you did just a recount of the four counties that Gore wanted recounted, Gore loses. So that's what the Republicans say. Well, hey, by Gore's standard, Bush wins. Hey, guess what? Gore doesn't get to decide. If Gore was too stupid to not want the whole state counted, a position that hopefully the Democrat would have had, right? Why does the country have to suffer because of his stupidity? So he formed the Arbusto Oil Company. And who was one of the investors of the Arbusto Oil Company? Bin Laden family money. Are you aware of this? What kind of a, is this just a coincidence that a Bin Laden attacked this country and killed 3,000 Americans while the son of an oil man here sat in the White House? Is that just, I guess it is, right? Why, if you go to the BBC website, you'll see a story from 1997 that says Taliban delegation hosted by oil executives in Houston. Are you aware of this? That while Bush was governor of Texas, Taliban leaders made several trips to Houston to meet with oil company executives to discuss the building of a pipeline across Afghanistan to bring natural gas from the Caspian Sea, from the former Soviet republics, through Afghanistan into Pakistan and out to the sea. Go to the Canadians. Go outside the country and read something in English. <laughs> and you will find some amazing facts. The circulation of the post is going up. Since we've been using bigger headlines, we've had more circulation. Uh, I can't explain that. Why 
Uh, although at Grand Central the other night, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, they had the, the headline, our headline was, Shah's nephew murdered, which was, you know, a perfectly legit story, but it had, had a very large headline. The paper, they couldn't sell the paper fast enough. You're and talking about the size of the print? Size of the print, I don't know what it is, 90 point or something. It was enormous. I don't think the big headlines will, will sell the papers, but it will attract people just to look at it. I think you get more news from television. Do you think it's more accurate? I think so, I think so. Why? Uh, you got more known uh, newscasters than you do uh, in uh, newspapers. Uh -huh. yeah. Would you withhold news uh, for the public's good? No I, I, no, I wouldn't withhold news, but you see, in a case, if you're, a if you're reporting uh, the likelihood or the prospects of a shortage of gas, that is where this contextual reporting that I speak of comes into it. You must explain that while in, in the last instance 10% of our imports come from Iran, effectively through the market, much of that goes to heating oil, therefore it doesn't go direct to, uh, to the gas pump. So the effective shortage is really only 1%. Newspapers, um, they don't invent stories. They go to people, experts in this country, uh, for their opinions on what's coming down or not coming down. Um, and if the um, Federal Reserve, Reserve Board Chairman says that I think that uh, we're in for a period of belt tightening, or if uh, a senator, if the head of a government department says, I think we're going to have inflationary times ahead, uh, that makes a news story. Then as a follow-up to that, uh, you might speak to Milton Friedman or someone in Chicago, and he'll say, yes, unless we have a much tighter monetary policy or a much looser monetary policy, depending on his mood, uh, we will have inflation. When Bill Kennard was appointed by Clinton to become the head of the FCC in 1990. Seven, I think it was, and, and he took over, and he was he was in office for about three years. I mean, one of the first things he had well, he had really only two or three things he was going to try to do. It's funny when Kennard came into office. What he he told me, I interviewed him. He said, before he assumed office as head of the SEC, he went and had uh, breakfast or lunch with all the previous heads of the SEC. Most of them still live in Washington, who are still alive, trying to pick their brains to figure out you know how he could be a good chair of the FCC. And he said one of them pulled him aside and said, "Look, son." Um, let me explain to you how the system works. It goes like this. When you're the head of the FCC, what you have to do to be successful is you have to understand you're refereeing fights between the, the super rich and the super, super rich. And the key to being successful is if you give the super rich lobby money one week, the next week you have to give it to the super, super rich. You'll, you'll be unsuccessful if you give all your money to the same group. You've got to balance them off. But that's what it's all about. And Kennard goes, God, I was so depressed when I heard that. I realized this is really not much of a job. It's really pretty corrupt. But he, but he was determined, to his credit, uh, to take one or two initiatives that would go outside the boundaries of traditional sort of what you could accomplish with the SEC. And one of them was he was convinced that we had to do something about this crisis of TV political ads, of campaign spending, to sort of rejuvenate the democracy or juvenate the democracy. And what he wanted to do was a very modest program of having free campaign time for candidates on the air prior to elections. So if they couldn't afford advertising, they would at least have a chance to reach the public. <clears throat> now this, of course, wouldn't directly hurt the, the TV stations in the sense that they could still sell their TV ads uh, to candidates, but it would mean also the candidates would be less reliant upon uh, those TV ads to reach the public, and secondly, it would mean that those candidates, uh, there'd be less time for the stations to sell because they'd have to give free time away, which of course they hate to do, even though it's public property that they don't pay for. So uh, he said, I'll try, he just broached the idea Maybe we should have some free campaign time for candidates as a condition of a broadcast license, since they're getting these valuable licenses for free. And Kennard made it, said that the response was unbelievable. You know, within two days, uh, within two days, people in Congress said if he continues with this, they'll have hearings to close down the FCC. Can you name names? Um, I, actually, this isn't yeah, this isn't top secret. This was actually published. I think it was Billy Towson, uh, head of the relevant committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, but it was the head of the committees. I mean, this was not obscure stuff. Uh, likewise, he said, and here... Is it, is it Cokie Roberts' brother, Tommy Boggs, a, a very big uh, NAB lobbyist? It sounds right. right. It wouldn't surprise me. Right. They've got a lot. 
Uh, likewise, uh, Kennard said he went to breakfast with some friends a couple days later. Well, what Kennard said is he traveled around the country his first few months in office. And whenever he'd raise the subject in any sort of public group, without exception, across the board, the response was enthusiastic. Everyone said, this is a great idea. Conservative, liberal, whatever your views, this is a great idea. No one could disagree with this. We're giving these companies this money. Let's get some free time for candidates. It can only be good for democracy. Uh, but he said, after he announced this in Washington, it was like he'd set off a neutron bomb or something, or like he'd uh, threatened chemical warfare. Congress threatened hearings to the FCC. He said he was taken to breakfast by old friends who were powerful in Washington. He didn't name their names. And they told him if he continued this, it would end his career. Uh, so he more or less sort of dropped it. Uh, understanding that it was impossible to do. But he said, isn't this ironic? Something that are, once you leave Washington, everyone loves. But as soon as you're in Washington, big money so controls the reins of debate, it's simply not even an issue you can raise. It's simply off the table. There are two other things that have been going on that are far more important in terms of media ownership. Uh, the first is something called vertical integration, which is another economics term. You know, horizontal integration means instead of producing 10% of the movies in the market, you produce 30%. So you're getting owned more and more of the market. Vertical integration means you own the different layers of production. So you not only produce movies, you also own the, the video rental store, the TV network, and the movie theaters where they're exhibited. And if you own production and distribution, and it's always been understood in economics and among regulators that vertical integration, far more than horizontal integration, or as much as horizontal integration, is the key to sort of guarantee locking in profit and limiting competition. Because if you own like all the f movie theaters and you own film production, if someone wants to compete with you, they've got to start up a whole movie theater chain and uh, start a movie studio. Uh, if, if they're separate industries, they'd only have to start one or the other, and then they could compete. It makes the degree of difficulty much higher. It also makes your profits much higher because you have much less risk. If you can guarantee theaters for your films when you make them, you're a filmmaker, you know that. That makes your job a lot easier than if you make a film and you've got to go out and try to find someone to exhibit it. And if you own the TV stations that are going to promote these films. And the t yeah, the well, we'll get, yeah. So in any case, vertical integration is something that regulators traditionally have really discouraged in media, understanding, you know, for a long time, for example, TV networks were not permitted to produce their own primetime shows. Because they knew if TV networks could produce their own primetime shows, they would never, no one else could produce them. They'd, they'd lock up the market. They wouldn't let anyone do it. So they prohibited that for a long time. And there was actually a flowering uh, business in Hollywood of independent companies that made primetime TV shows, uh, which is pretty much in the process of disappearing now that that re regulation's been relaxed. Because uh, it's very rational for a big company to want to be vertically integrated. And once your competitors are vertically integrated, you've got to do it or you can't compete. What are the advantages of uh, synergy or conglomeration? Well, one of them that's absolutely important is what's called cross-promotion. What, what that means is if you make a movie, for example, um, you can promote that movie across all your media properties. Uh, at a much lower cost than if you actually had to buy ads. And you can work it into your other media properties. So when, for example, Viacom, which owns Paramount, made a movie for Clueless in the early to mid-90s, uh, which is a big hit, um, what it was able to do is it, it could run advertising and promotion for Clueless incessantly on MTV and on Nickelodeon to generate an audience. Uh, it couldn't have done that if it hadn't owned MTV and Nickelodeon. Uh, likewise, when Paramount Pictures put out a Rugrats movie based on their cartoon on Nickelodeon, they could have the Entertainment Tonight show, which they own and produce, do a week-long special on the making of the Rugrats movie. So this gives you promotional ability that's really quite impressive. You can create a market for a product that would be impossible if you only made movies and you didn't have those other tools. And so it means basically everyone's got to be part of one of these systems, so they really are at a competitive disadvantage. You just can't survive, which is why the independents all sell off, because they're worth so much more uh, to a conglomerate, and they can't compete as an independent. It's not clear you can make a lot of money by being a dominant player in a lot of different media sectors. In fact, you have to be a dominant player in a lot of media sectors. So the largest media companies today are all full-scale media conglomerates, meaning that while in music, for example, there are five companies that sell 90% of the music, four of those five companies are part of the six largest media companies in the world that have film studios, TV networks, book publishing interests, the works. Uh, all the film studios, all the major film studios are part of the largest media conglomerates that have TV networks, TV stations, music companies. 
all across the board, the independent big company that just does music, just does books, just does films, has gone the way of the dodo. The economics of the industry are such that there are such spectacular advantages to being a conglomerate, what they call synergy, that if you aren't one, you can't survive, you can't compete. And it's, this has been sort of the motor economic force that has spurred this tremendous amount of concentration unbeknownst to the public. Look at the music industry in the 1950s, you know, it was pretty easy to start a new uh, music company, recording company. There were dozens and dozens, and most of the giants just were barely in existence then, uh, the ones that dominate today. Now, if you're, now think for a second in a way most people don't think. Think like you're an owner of one of these companies, not a, someone who buys records or buys newspapers, but someone rather who owns the company that produces films, produces music, produces newspapers. And you're trying to make as much money as possible. And, you, and like, you know, one of the myths of our society, you've probably heard this one, is it's based on competition. Have you heard that? That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the sort of pablum they feed us in the bottom fish. The truth of the matter is at the top of the system, the key to the system, is crushing competition. I mean, the reason why Bill Gates is worth $60 billion isn't because there are 10,000 people selling the same product as him. It's because there's no one else selling the same product as him effectively. He's got a monopoly. If you go right down the list of all the great fortunes, the less competition you have, it's an iron law. The more likely you are to clean up. Uh, that's the goal. It's irrational to want competition for yourself. It's rational to want all your, everyone else to have competition. You want workers to compete for jobs. You want suppliers to compete to sell you stuff. But in your market, the rational thing is to smash all competition. So what we've seen in media rationally is that in all the sectors, you've had fewer and fewer companies. The largest companies buy the small companies. They try to get bigger and bigger and make it harder for new companies to enter. Because once you have just a handful of companies dominate an industry, the ability for someone to enter the industry as a newcomer is almost impossible once there are few companies that are huge. And that process has taken place in our media system in the last 50 years dramatically. It's built right into the system. Take music as the classic case. You know, dozens and dozens of record companies in the 50s. It was relatively easy to start. Dozens and dozens. Well, they've got smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon you had to have global distribution networks to distribute your fare and to collect money for it. So if you wanted to start to compete, you had to be able to set up a global distribution system. The cost of doing that's very high. How many music companies do we have today that sell 90% of the music in the United States? Five. Five companies. 80% of the music in the world. And you can't start a music company now and compete with those guys. The costs are so high, it's an irrational thing to do. That process has taken place in movie theater ownership and radio and television, book publishing. They've all shrunk down. That's called horizontal um, integration in economic terms. I mean, you, you shall sell more and more of your market. And that tends to be a very bad thing for the general public and a very good thing for those companies. Because it's great for you if you're one of only five companies. It means you can control your prices you sell at, you face much less risk, and your chance of making profits are much higher. And, the, and you have less threat of new competition. It gives them more market power and less competition the bigger they are to do as they want to make as much money as possible. And they use that in many ways, but most notably they use it first and foremost to sort of hyper-commercialize the content. Uh, to basically take every nanosecond of time, every square uh, centimeter of space, and try to find a way to make money off of it. And so we marinated our entire media culture in, in sort of a, a grotesque commercialism that very in, uh, undermines the, the great work that could be done. I mean, we, we spend billions and billions of dollars on media in this country, but the, what we get for it is much less than we should. And there's, we produce some great stuff, but it's well below what could be produced under different circumstances, especially about, given the um, immense amount of resources that go to it. Then you say, well, what exactly did these debates take place? I've never seen them in the newspaper, on TV. I've never heard about them. Politicians don't debate them. When did they allocate the cable systems? When did they allocate the TV channels? When did they set up these rules giving go copyright protection to these big companies so they can keep you know, gouging money with monopoly rights to these products? And uh, the fact is that they all take place, but you just don't know about them. And they take place behind closed doors, and that is the truth of how our media system is structured. And the, and the fact is that media companies live in fear that the American people will ever find out about this and actually intervene. I mean, it's the great fear they have. They want this thing closed off. The classic case of this came, uh, it's historically shown time and time again, but in 1995 and 1996, when the, the government, the Congress passed the Telecommunications Act, which changed entirely all the laws really regarding uh, electronic media in the United States, 
uh, so obsessed were the media companies that this thing not ever get into public debate that they dis discouraged even congressional hearings on the most controversial matters. They wanted all this stuff done as quietly as possible. Because uh, they understand once people hear about, gee, we're giving away $70 billion in free airwaves to these companies, well, I th while we're cutting out food stamps for poor people, you know, what's going on? This is, this is crazy. Why is welfare for billionaires okay, but not for, you know, starving people okay? Uh, that that wouldn't, flash, that wouldn't pass. The American people wouldn't stand for it. The, the thing that has to be understood that's not understood at all is that we don't, our media system is the natural thing. It's not like uh, uh, the mountain ranges that geologically evolved over hundreds of millions of years or the solar system. It's something like we can't control. Uh, it's, you know, it's something that's millions or hundreds of millions of years old. It's out, we just have to accept it for the duration of our lifetimes on Earth. Media systems, communication systems, are entirely the result of policies uh, that create them. Uh, it was government policies that create the whole television and radio system by l allocating airwaves to certain companies. Uh, you know, once you give someone monopoly rights to television stations, in, uh, to television frequencies in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, a trained chimpanzee can become a billionaire running those. It's pretty hard to blow it. The government creates uh, these companies, creates the giants. All our largest media companies, without exception, the largest five or six, are built around government sanctioned monopolies, monopoly rights to airwaves or monopoly rights to cable systems. Then they can use those monopoly profits to go out and buy film studios and other things. So what you see are uh, things like book contracts given to someone for a few million dollars to curry their favor with an advance uh, to a Newt Gingrich, say, in the United States that Murdoch's company did, or to the leader of China's daughter, uh, as he did in China. And that's done periodically. But even that doesn't, that's really small potatoes. I mean, the real corruption comes in a place like China, where when Murdoch's trying to set up his TV service, he will uh, do a joint venture with the Chinese, where the Chinese half will be represented by the children of the Central Committee. So I mean, you're setting up the children of the head of the Chinese Communist Party as partners in a multi billionaire dollar venture. That's the real corruption. That's when we're talking the serious stakes here. I mean, PR is based on something very fundamental to human nature, which is if I tell you that my last book is the best book that's ever been written, you're going to say, yeah, of course you are, because you're selling the book. It's in your interest. But if someone else tells you that, that I don't know, that I have no connection to, you're going to be more likely to believe them. And that's the whole principle. You use public relations to pummel the population. Uh, with messages that, you know, labor unions are bad, government spending is bad, business is good, entrepreneurs create jobs, and keep a steady stream of propaganda on behalf of uh, corporate interests so that you don't have to fear, as Madison feared, that the mass of the property list will use their political power to exercise their uh, own interest against the interest of the few. Now, the case of Murdoch is very interesting in his news corporation because this is, an example of this, he's taken this really to its fullest extent with his Fox News Channel. The Fox News Channel, which is his American TV news service, uh, is very interesting because it doesn't do journalism. They basically disbanded the whole notion of covering news because that's expensive. Instead, what they have are basically people pontificate, like Bill O'Reilly and Hannity and Combs and Britt Hume. They don't really do any journalism. They sort of bark out opinions in the air. And what Rupert Murdoch has shown is that you can make more money doing that than doing what CNN was doing. CNN was actually had 25 foreign bureaus or whatever, or some figure like that. They're actually breaking stories, trying to do journalism, for better or for worse, but they're actually trying to do journalism. Well, they were making um, pretty good money doing that. Actually, they were quite profitable doing that. But Rupert Murdoch showed you could make the same revenues doing his journalism and cut your costs in half by getting rid of all the journalists and just having pontificators. And so they've set the sort of new, they've lowered the bar now. So what happened at CNN is in 1999, uh, they got rid of, or 2000, excuse me, they fired their president, or removed him, he left. Uh, it's the head of CNN, even Rick Kaplan. Even though under Kaplan's stead, you know, CNN in its last year he was running it, made something like $300 million net 
um, sales of just over a billion dollars. I mean, spectacularly successful. But Kaplan, that wasn't good enough because Fox had shown if you get rid of all these foreign bureaus and reporters and just have pontificators, you can lower your costs and keep the revenues the same. You make another couple hundred million. And that's what, you know, that's what they wanted Kaplan to do. And he said, no, I, that's not the way I'm going to do it. That's, that's not good journalism. But Rupert Murdoch has shown you can keep taking that bar lower and lower uh, and make money. And, he, and that's, this system is always going to gravitate to wherever that bar can be the lowest to make the most money, because that's the logic in it. There's always going to be someone, if Rupert Murdoch doesn't do it, Sumner Redstone will do it, or Michael Eisner, or someone else. Whether you, if you've got one newspaper in the market or 100, if they're trained professionals, you're going to get the same story. So you might as well just have one, because they're all trained professionals. They're going to cover it neutrally, professionally, the same way. That's the theory of professional journalism. Now, we know a couple things about it right away. First of all, um, it's not neutral. Uh, ben Bagdikian has a wonderful discussion of this in his book, The Media Monopoly. It's really quite the uh, starting point of this discussion. Built into this, of course, are, are key values that turn professional